and uh, uh, I guess I should uh, start off by uh, thanking the organizers for the invitation to come here. <laughs> and actually, it's not so much the Bill and Ken, actually, but uh, uh, Lodovico, who's not here, actually, uh, I mean, this is a, a meeting that's been in planning since 2004, and he was certainly central one to supporting it in the first place and then uh, getting it almost to where we are today. And of course, Paola, uh, she's not here, but uh, I want to record my thanks for her, and we'll do it at the end. And of course, uh, um, uh, Colin mentioned about Joel, who's uh, the last speaker, and uh, uh, Joel was the uh, organizer of the 2004 meeting uh, that I was at, uh, uh, and uh, uh, it was a, a defining uh, moment for me, and, uh, and certainly it's just fantastic to be back here again with Kenneth uh, directing uh, this course. So uh, I, I want to, uh, uh, to talk, but uh, actually I was uh, interested uh, uh, in uh, Joel saying that there's been a lot of uh, Scottish accents. He's just had the New York one, but if you didn't ken a word, I'd say just bide your wished, okay? <laughs> right, Kenneth understands that. <laughs> just. Anyway, uh, in my notes, you'll see this uh, figure. Uh, it's a figure, in fact, uh, uh, that uh, uh, came out of the uh, ILL. It's uh, looking at uh, the evolution uh, of the crystal and magnetic structure of uh, strontium cobalt oxide. And uh, here's one of my heroes, uh, Jean Pinetier, who in many ways uh, uh, started the, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, this process of parametric diffraction off in a real way. Computing uh, had the power in the early 80s to be able to start tackling problems of this sort of size. And Jean Pinetier, uh, who was the instrument scientist on D1B uh, at the ILL, uh, really pioneered this. Uh, uh, tragically, uh, Jean uh, uh, died of uh, cancer uh, just uh, uh, before uh, the year 2000, uh, and uh, he was a good friend and uh, sorely missed. So 2011, and uh, we've moved on 30 years. Computing, as we know, has, uh, uh, has moved on a long way, and uh, the complexity of what we can handle has gone on uh, a long way as well. And so we are dealing with complex systems, systems that vary, systems that change, systems that evolve, uh, and there's an abundance of data. Uh, and uh, if you look uh, here, here's uh, some measurements that we've been, been making on these hydride systems. Uh, this is looking at the uh, uh, phase transition sequences in calcium borohydride as a function of temperature. You'll all understand these surface uh, maps, so I won't go through and, uh, uh, and take you step by step through that. But uh, here we are, we're going from uh, lithium um, uh, amide uh, to lithium uh, imide. Well, it's lithium amide plus lithium nitride to make. Uh, lithium uh, imide, it should be a very straightforward reaction. It looks like that here. We're warming up in temperature, but in the middle, life gets complicated. And so we're dealing with all these complex systems. And how do we go about parameterizing them? Uh, this is a slide, in fact, that uh, I borrowed from Andy Fitch's talk, and I just thought it was a spectacular talk, not just the way in which Andy delivered it, but just what he was telling us in terms of what the capabilities are. And having been in the field now for 30 years and seen the advances, you, you, you young guys in 30 years' time, I've no idea uh, where you're going to be and what the opportunities are, uh, but they're certainly going to be abundant. This is uh, some work that we've done with neutrons, just as you... Uh, so that you can see that you get this complexity of data from neutrons as well. Andy was saying this in his talk. Uh, we have very rapid instruments uh, uh, now at places like the ILL and, uh, and at ISIS. And what we're looking at here is the absorption and desorption of lithium amide to lithium imide. And it really is clearly quite complex. And we can essentially uh, move the lattice constants around with just a, a bar or so of hydrogen uh, on these systems. And so we have complexity to deal with. And so I, I sat and uh, I sort of rewrote my talk last night, actually. I, I missed uh, the dancing and some of the heroics that I've seen on, uh, uh, on mobile phones uh, uh, last night, but uh, I missed uh, that uh, because I was wondering about what the word parametric really meant and how could I uh, usefully you know, describe the sort of things that we can do, the sort of challenges that we face. Uh, and so I've, I've phrased a, a few questions here. Uh, how do we parameterize our structural model to describe the full process, that whole uh, surface uh, there, uh, and at the same time, obtain the best information from our powder diffraction data. Because as we've been hearing, we are limited compared to single crystal data sets. We simply don't have that amount of information. John Wright said, uh, you know, if he's seen 1,000 peaks, that's the best he's done. And we might have pushed it uh, to 2,000, but give or take one or 2,000, that's where we are at the moment. It's probably where we're going to end up. And so we're almost limited in an individual data set with what we can extract. But of course, with multiple data sets, we can learn uh, a bigger picture. So how do we best minimize 
the number of variables so that we do not overinterpret the data. That's another challenge uh, that we're faced with. Uh, it's easy to try to push things too far, and when we do that, some of the structures that we uh, end up with really do look like spaghetti. Uh, but, uh, uh, and if you go to the Cambridge uh, uh, database, actually, you'll see that there's essentially a health warning tick. Do you want to actually screen uh, for your particular uh, bond angle or torsion angle, uh, and do you want to use powder diffraction data in this? And that's partly because a lot of the time uh, we are tempted to overinterpret the data. How do we avoid that? Uh, and of course, uh, it would also be best to parameterize our structural model so that we extract the information that we really want. Uh, and so in some ways, uh, a better title would be, what's the best way to parameterize a powder diffraction experiment? How do, you, how do we go about doing that? And uh, rather than actually going through it uh, methodologically, I'm just going to th go through with, uh, with a few examples uh, some of the things that I've done with my uh, collaborators, and, uh, and I'll show you, you the unholy group of them uh, at the end. Um, here's a, a paper, actually, and uh, two of the uh, uh, authors are actually uh, in the audience here. This is Jaroslav Filinchuk and uh, uh, Radovan Czerny. And this is magnesium borohydride, and Radovan's already shown you how complex this is. In fact, the rules for building this structure are very simple, they're the same as building uh, uh, framework silicates, but look at this plethora of data. Now, in fact, uh, this, was also, this was also, in fact, uh, uh, done with single crystals, and there's single crystal information actually in these data. But uh, can we really extract that reliability of information? And actually, is the best way of presenting it uh, just a series, a list of X, Y, Z, and coordinates? Wouldn't it be better? Uh, to, uh, uh, to, to refine things in terms of boron hydrogen distances and uh, perhaps the, uh, uh, the orientation of that BH4 group to, and, to, and to basically reduce the number of parameters. And of course, this is something uh, uh, that we who have been involved with uh, global optimization methods have been forced to do in terms of looking for a solution, trying to get that parameter space down to a manageable extent so that we're not searching you know, all the X, Y, Z coordinates uh, uh, because we know all these parameters there. Can we actually go in and, and do something that's, that's robust, reliable, accurate, uh, and sensible? Uh, so we know uh, bond lengths and bond angles. These internal dihedral angles, the, the free torsion angles, we don't know. And so this, in this case of uh, uh, semesidine, if we do go through this process, then we can reduce the number of uh, parameters from 48 down to 13. And clearly, that's a benefit. And the other, uh, the, the other 35 parameters, in fact, you know, we, we may well be able to tweak them, but in fact, we're probably not going to get any additional sense. Now, of course, uh, if we find that we don't fit the data well, we've got to, got, to, got to go in and start investigating which of these 35 parameters should we not have fixed, which are, are, are not allowed to vary. So, uh, but starting off with a limited set and extending out, I think, is a better process uh, than starting uh, with the 48 and trying to uh, go down. And, uh, and in fact, uh, this has been around for a long time. Uh, some of you have, uh, I guess most of you have probably not, never heard of this program, EDMP, by Stuart Polly. He's famous for the Polly method. But in fact, uh, before then, uh, he'd actually come up with this program. And uh, this program actually basically refines bond lengths and angles, not coordinates. And there are a number of papers, in fact, uh, that refer to this work. And uh, uh, if you see uh, you know, here, actually, he's refining uh, uh, carbon sulfur distances, oxygen carbon distances, uh, angles. Uh, sorry, that's a distance, actually. Uh, and so he's refining uh, those parameters because he was aware, an extremely clever man, that in these data there, he simply didn't have enough information. He was forced to go down this route. And when we, when we get to more ambitious structures, I think that we're still in that position today. So I wanted to, I showed you this on the first day, actually, uh, and, uh, and, and I wanted to, to show this again uh, just, to, just to highlight uh, the, uh, the power of Topaz and, and, I, and I hope will be the power of, uh, of the future programs that uh, uh, we're going to be using for, uh, uh, for our root health analysis for a structured solution where we can use this flexible computer algebra to parameterize things the way we want to do it. And I showed you these data, and uh, so we, we see something of the order of 2,000 uh, peaks here uh, because we're going down to 0.3 angstroms in despacing. And uh, the point that I showed is, uh, is this here, and I can, I'm going to spend just slightly longer on this. Here's a parameter, and it's the single bond length and the double bond length, actually 1.45 and 1.396 angstroms. These are the, uh, uh, the, uh, the estimated uh, uncertainties uh, that are actually returned in the refinement process. And actually, there are five, in Peter Stevens's talk in FM3 symmetry, he said there are three separate um, uh, carbon atoms. Uh, uh, the symmetry is marginally lower here. It's PA3 symmetry, uh, and we're down to five 
uh, separate uh, uh, parameter, five separate uh, uh, coordinates. And, and these are enough to build up the buckyball. So I'm not going to show you how I then go up and build up the buckyball, uh, but uh, uh, this is all that we need to do, and we're uh, using TAW, uh, the, uh, the golden ratio, which is actually there to a ridiculous number of significant figures, totally unnecessary. Uh, but just with this here, you know, I'm able to build up the whole of the buckyball structure. And then in the refinement, only to refine the important things. And uh, I don't really care what the coordinates are. That's not important. That's not where the chemistry is. The chemistry is in the parameters which are the single and the double bond lengths. And of course, you can do, this is complexity in the background, and we'll hear a lot more about that over the next few days, and the challenges of how far can we push uh, the uh, 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 pair distribution function. How, how, far can we, uh, uh, how far can we get uh, in doing that? But the reward, if you actually parameterize things uh, you know, carefully in terms of the numbers uh, that you want, is that you end up with these incredibly uh, uh, precise, I won't say accurate, but uh, I believe that they are accurate, certainly probably within a factor of uh, two or three in terms of the uh, uh, uncertainties. Uh, but we get these very precise um, values for uh, single and double bond lengths. And the orientation, in fact, with respect to uh, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the 1, 1, 1 direction, uh, we can get that, again, very precisely. The fraction of these two orientations that I mentioned the other day, again, we're getting to very high precision. And we can pull thermodynamics out of this. Andy Fitch talked a little bit about that in one of his examples. And in fact, actually, we've gone to such high Q to such short despacing that we can show, in fact, that the hexagonal orientation is slightly disordered. There are actually six positions for the hexagonal orientation. We can pull that out of the powder data. And we'd have, we wouldn't have stood a chance of doing that uh, if we'd actually just defined x, y, z coordinates. So the parameterization uh, is important. But in fact, uh, in, my, uh, uh, in my notes, uh, I, I was talking more about how do, how do you parameterize uh, things like uh, uh, the, 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 the sequence uh, of data uh, that you get from one of these uh, uh, multiple experiments where you're looking at a, a reaction or you're looking at the transformation uh, of a material as a function of temperature. And uh, here's the lattice constant. Uh, this is adamantane, molecular diamond, C10, H16. And that looks like a, a relatively uh, simple curve to fit. Uh, and in fact, because life's never simple, uh, there's actually a phase transition in there. And I won't go into the uh, description of how do you actually, how do you, how do you get the best information out in terms of uh, refining phase transitions. I think uh, uh, Laurent will talk perhaps a little bit about that uh, in a couple of days' time in terms of uh, magnetic structures. But the Bazireps things that he mentioned in Foolprof, the idea of going in and looking at the, uh, uh, the eigenvectors of the different uh, irreducible representations and working out the magnitudes of the distortions, you can apply to the internal coordinates, and that's a very efficient way of parameterization. You can also refer that to the, uh, uh, to the lattice constants as well. And there, you can actually build up you know, a proper physical understanding based on uh, things like Landa theory and understand uh, the mechanisms of what's going on in terms of order disorder phase transitions, displacive phase transitions. But um, what uh, uh, I wanted to do is to say, well, it's actually easier, in fact, initially, uh, to talk about uh, vibrations. Uh, and uh, these, are, um, uh, these are movies that have been obtained by doing uh, a density functional theory analysis uh, and obtaining the phonons from uh, lithium amido borane and other of the materials that we've been working on and actually matching that up against inelastic neutron scattering data. And there we can see uh, uh, this clapping hand. This is basically NH2 going like this, and it's actually a very high frequency. You don't populate this at room temperature at all. Whereas here we've got something that's principally uh, a BH3 motion, and that's actually happening at relatively low frequency. Each of these are phonons. Each of these has a specific frequency, 243 centimeters to the minus 1, 1575 centimeters to the minus 1. So it's a, you know, that's a frequency, a single frequency. And uh, if we... Uh, Oh, let me see if I can get on here now. Yeah, so here's a, here's a quantum harmonic oscillator, uh, and uh, uh, at a particular temperature, let's say relatively low temperature, we're in the ground state, perhaps there's a, a small amount uh, in the first excited state, and obviously if we uh, warm the material up, we start populating uh, these higher excited states. And, uh, and we can actually go on, uh, and, uh, and I don't need to go through the maths, you can actually find that in most uh, textbooks, but uh, essentially we're dealing with something that's like a spring, let's say, or a, a rotation we can think of you know, as a sort of a, 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 a rotational spring. Uh, and so we can actually end up with the, um, the, the mean, mean square displacement, which is in fact our temperature factor, and we can actually relate that to uh, what uh, Einstein uh, uh, initially derived as the, uh, you know, the average energy associated with a, a quantum harmonic oscillator. So we can apply 
these equations here directly uh, to, uh, uh, to, um, uh, to temperature factors, the displacement parameters. But again, you know, we have to be careful in the way in which we do that. In fact, this is a rather unusual one, and again, you've got the flexibility in Topaz to be able to do this. This isn't actually looking uh, uh, at uh, uh, a straightforward anisotropic displacement parameter. It's saying there's libration. In fact, the BH3 and the NH3 and ammonia borane actually, they spin at different frequencies. It's not a rigid body. Uh, and uh, we can actually, from the... Um, from the, uh, the, the data that we've collected, actually look at the, uh, the frequency associated with these different librations by, fit, by fitting this Einstein oscillator. Uh, and we come up, uh, I've given the energy uh, in, in Kelvin here, because that's the easiest way, obviously, of fitting the data. Uh, fitting lattice parameters, in fact, actually, is a bit more complicated. So what I've got here, actually, is the inelastic neutron scattering spectrum, and the, uh, uh, and the, and the smooth line, actually, is the, uh, is the DFT uh, fit to the data. Uh, it's not Rietveld quality, but in fact, actually, that's, that's, pretty, that's pretty good uh, to be able to do that for uh, an elastic neutron scattering data. These are the two uh, individual uh, frequencies there, and we can actually describe each of these by an Einstein oscillator. Uh, but it was, in fact, Debye in 1912 who said, actually, the uh, Einstein uh, uh, description of uh, oscillations is fine for an individual oscillator, but in fact, at low frequencies, there's a quadratic uh, continuum of density of states, and we've got to model it in that way so that when we go to very low temperatures, uh, the, um, the motion, uh, at least the, uh, the energy, doesn't go exponentially to zero, it goes in a parallel way. And in fact, uh, this is the equation here. I've got it in the notes. It's actually relatively easy to program up, and it's important, and in fact, uh, certainly worth doing that, and I'll have an example of that later. So here's uh, adamantane, and we can already see this is actually fitting a single Dubai fit here that by uh, you know, 100 uh, uh, Kelvin or so, there's clearly discrepancies. And that's because we're beginning to see the tendency towards this uh, first order transition to a cubic phase. Here's the, uh, the C-axis, and again, we can see a similar discrepancy. Again, so it helps us actually, it informs us more about what's going on. Uh, and uh, so we have that movement up towards this, uh, uh, this second phase here. Uh, here's the, uh, the data at 5 Kelvin, and again, this is on HRPD at ISIS, and uh, uh, these data go on, uh, that's 0.5 angstroms to, uh, to 1 angstrom there. Uh, and again, we've got a huge amount of information, that's a reasonably good uh, uh, difference curve here. Uh, and in fact, uh, uh, I've used uh, 40 uh, anisotropic displacement parameters, and these are all independently done. Uh, and of course, they're not all uh, independent of each other, but in fact, in terms of the number of parameters, there are 40 of them. And they're actually really pretty good. Uh, but uh, they're not perfect, uh, and uh, if you actually uh, go and do uh, um, a full TLS analysis, and uh, I won't describe in detail what that means, some of you will be familiar with that, but uh, I'll give you just a, a brief idea of, uh, of what that actually is. Uh, full TLS analysis uh, gives you something that's equally as good, and in fact, you move from 40 parameters down to four. Okay, so you have much more confidence in what you're doing. Uh, and basically, your anisotropic displacement parameter, your temperature factor, uh, you, you can divide up into three terms, a translation term, so the whole rigid body's moving, uh, a libration term, like that NH3 group was actually rotating around, and then there's a sort of a complicated screw uh, rotation if you've actually got something that's not sitting on a center of symmetry. We are sitting on a center of symmetry, so all the S terms go. I see it's a bar four uh, site, in fact, so in fact we have a high degree of symmetry there. And so, uh, if I look at the parameters there, there are only four. Okay, so I can actually uh, then uh, go from the 40 ADB parameters down to the four, uh, and, uh, and, and then I can start looking at things parametrically as a function of temperature, and say, you know, how does that T11, that translational, how does the T33 vary as a function of temperature? Unsurprisingly, uh, they're basically the same. You would expect that, but it's nice and reassuring that you do get that. In terms of the libration, in fact, again, you see that the libration is a softer uh, one. We got uh, temperature, no, no sorry, the, um, the translation, sorry. It's easier to move up and down than for it to librate. And so we're getting numbers out that uh, inform us. Now, of course, the better thing to do would be to do uh, an elastic neutron scattering measurement uh, or a Raman uh, or, a, um, uh, or a, a other sort of spectroscopy measurement. But here we are actually getting valuable data uh, out. C60, and again, I briefly want to uh, go on and uh, uh, talk about that as well. Actually, I, I mentioned it uh, uh, in, on the first day, and I think there's a, there's a, there's a lot of you know, interesting uh, ideas that, uh, you know, that uh, we can pick up just from going through and doing a comprehensive analysis of what's going on. Uh, I'm not going to talk about the order disorder transition up here. Uh, I'm going to talk mainly about uh, uh, that low temperature uh, orientational glass transition. So I mentioned 
uh, at the very beginning about these two orientations that are clearly very similar. You've got a, a face uh, pointing towards a, a double bond, uh, and that face is either a hexagon uh, or a, uh, uh, sorry, a pentagon uh, or a hexagon. And the uh, hexagon actually turns out to be a slightly smaller, uh, it's, it's actually a slightly smaller um, volume that it occupies, but it's energetically less favorable. Uh, and, uh, uh, and that's why, in fact, we have this, this six-fold disorder down at the, the base temperature. It does actually settle into sort of rattling around a little bit. But the measurement that we did is we cooled rapidly at 10 Kelvin a measurement and uh, at 10 Kelvin a minute, and then we slowly heated because we were collecting data on the way up at two Kelvins per 20 minutes. And uh, if you actually look uh, here at this orientational glass transition uh, above this point here, uh, then uh, uh, the reorientation time is actually uh, less than 20 minutes. There's enough thermal energy uh, for things to move around, and so they can freely move around. But when we go below uh, the uh, glass transition here, uh, then the orientational time is very, very sluggish, and in the uh, space of an experiment, it simply doesn't move. So it freezes in to this non-equilibrium position. And that's why the lattice constant changes. Okay. In fact, what we can do, because we know these two orientations, and I showed you these very precise numbers uh, that we've got now, but in, uh, in the old days, in fact, uh, uh, what we did is we can just do, uh, you know, uh, basically a, a refinement. It's not two phase. Uh, it's basically it's two orientations, and we can refine one and the other. And in fact, this is flat here. That slight, uh, that slight come up here is to do, in, in fact, with the uh, uh, heading towards thermal equilibrium. And you can see uh, there's a line here, and again, we're fitting it. We've got a parametric analysis, and we're pulling out uh, some, uh, uh, some thermodynamic information, and in fact, from that, because we're in thermodynamic equilibrium there, we can actually tell you know, which is the lower energy. It's obviously the one where we have more, uh, or we have more uh, of a population, uh, and uh, we can invert uh, the Boltzmann distribution to see, and I'm doing this again in, in Kelvin, actually, uh, that something of the order uh, of about uh, uh, 150 Kelvin or so. And that's the difference in orientation uh, between, uh, sorry, the difference in energy between uh, the pentagon and hexagon orientation. So we pull that out of our crystallographic data just by doing this uh, Boltzmann in you know, inversion of the populations of the two states. So that's something that you can do, you know, for, uh, you know, for any similar system. Now, I'm actually, uh, you know, it's, uh, I'm, I'm blowing up uh, this region of the glass transition here. Down here, of course, we've got a fixed uh, ratio because uh, they're frozen into the glass surface, so a fixed ratio of, let's say, 82%. If, in fact, actually we kept on cooling infinitely slowly, uh, then we follow that line there. So this, in fact, actually is uh, the uh, thermodynamic equilibrium one, and here we have a fixed uh, uh, ratio, and uh, they're not, they don't agree. Uh, you can see the, you know, this axis here, that's point double not five angstroms. Uh, so we're actually looking at a very, very small effect, and that's, again, you know, the need and the requirement of uh, precise data. So we have the thermal equilibrium lattice constant, uh, we have the cumulative return towards uh, thermal equilibrium here because we're beginning to unlock earlier uh, because we're actually warming up more slowly than we cool down. So things unlock that little bit earlier. Uh, and here's this non-equilibrium lattice constant. And in fact, that we fit, and we fit with a Debye term. This is a constant term. Here's a Debye term here uh, and an Einstein term. So we're actually taking the density of states and we're modeling it with this quadratic um, Debye term to begin with, and then a single Einstein oscillator uh, for everything else. Now, you might say, well, what about the higher frequency ones? Well, they're not populated. And why only one? In fact, uh, the data are fitted extremely well, right down to seeing the non-power law uh, behavior from the the Dubai um, term down at the lowest temperatures. And so we get a very precise line here. Now that's important uh, because uh, what we want to be able to do is to develop a, a model and it's a cumulative return towards thermal equilibrium. So as uh, so we're warming up and say so we're warming up more slowly, uh, then we begin to unlock. Some of them start uh, rotating uh, around actually. We warm up a bit more and actually more of them begin to uh, uh, warm up because in fact actually the temperature is higher uh, and uh, so you can see this cumulative return towards equilibrium. These are two Kelvin steps. And within about 10 Kelvin, in fact, we've gone from uh, frozen to unfrozen. And uh, this is the, uh, uh, the equation here. You don't need to worry about it. But we can actually go in and we can fit uh, these data. And again, fit this. We've taken a parametric model to explore this return towards uh, thermal, thermal equilibrium. Uh, and uh, we can pull out uh, you know, these numbers here. Uh, and in fact, these, these are the derived numbers, in fact, from the refinement. 
uh, and you can see uh, that we've actually got uh, something of the order of 100,000 seconds here down to about, uh, about 3,000 seconds at 82 Kelvin. It's gone down by a factor of, uh, of uh, 20 or 30 just in that length of time there. And this is actually fitting it to an Arrhenius-type behavior, which actually gives us um, uh, basically an activation energy for the hopping. And so what we have actually from doing the Boltzmann uh, uh, inversion actually of the populations, uh, we got the uh, 122 Kelvin for the, for the difference between these two orientations in energy. It's a 42 degree hop between the uh, uh, two uh, orientations uh, along the 110 direction. And in fact, it's at 2,500 uh, to jump over that uh, 42 degrees. And we can pull that out, both of these pieces of data out from powder diffraction data. It happens to be the only technique that you can actually do that with. Uh, so we've got, uh, uh, we got this uh, information here, and this is something that uh, I, mean, I was just, uh, you know, just amazed at the time, actually, because down at, uh, uh, or at least up at 240 Kelvin, just before it uh, uh, goes to this uh, completely disordered phase, in fact, actually, it is hopping uh, around these 40 degree, two, 2 degree hops, and that's on the surface of a truncated icosahedron, it's, so it's doing essentially an isotropic uh, hop. It's actually going on the uh, sub-nanosecond time scales. And we're up at uh, 10 to the 4, 10 to the 5 seconds. And in fact, we're the slowest experiment. And slow, in this case, is actually good, uh, because actually it means we've got uh, right at the top here. And we can see over all these ranges here that there is actually a small change uh, in the activation energy as a function of temperature. We can see that. But in fact, actually, if you look, uh, we got uh, 15 orders of magnitude difference going from uh, 80 Kelvin to 240 Kelvin. That's the reorientation of correlation time change by 15 orders of magnitude. And that's the same uh, difference in time scale between uh, a minute and the uh, length of the universe. So I want to uh, move uh, quickly on. How, how am I doing for time, Colin? Hmm? You haven't seen how much I've got yet. <laughs> um, I want very quickly to, uh, to go through this for two reasons, because uh, it uh, brings back fond memories. It's, uh, work, the first one is work that uh, I did with, with Colin, the second uh, with, uh, with Kenneth. Uh, and so the first one, the parasitable hydrates, uh, uh, I want to do with uh, uh, Colin. And Colin and I have uh, uh, complementary expertise. Uh, he's good looking and I'm not. <laughs> We're both bald, though. <laughs> But uh, this is the experiment that we did, and I want very quickly to go through this, because um, uh, Colin actually raced into the, uh, to the hutch uh, on ID31 uh, with, a, uh, with a cotton bud uh, that was dipped in liquid nitrogen, touched it, instantly froze this uh, supersaturated solution of paracetamol, acetaminophen, uh, wavelengths 0.8 angstroms, and he got out the hutch as quickly as he could, um, uh, making sure that he observed the safety regulations on the way out. So it took a minute to get out, everything's going again. So we, we lost the first minute, uh, but we did 130 runs, uh, and basically 30 seconds uh, a measurement, and we actually watched uh, uh, the, uh, the process as a function of time. And this is something that actually that we stayed and we studied, and in fact, it's a good job that we did, uh, because uh, as we were warming up, uh, to 35 centigrade from zero centigrade, uh, then uh, everything suddenly disappeared. Uh, and uh, so uh, what we uh, did immediately is we said we you know, you know, shot the cooler off, came down to 30 centigrade, and uh, believe it or not, this is actually paracetamol form two, just actually made from water. Okay, so this is a, a very simple way. We actually discovered this completely by accident. It's one of the uh, accidents that, uh, uh, that Joe was uh, mentioning earlier on. Uh, so, so here we are, and this, we've got this huge surface. I mean, what do we do? How do we actually go in there and analyze it? And uh, I want to just very quickly go through this, because in fact, there's just an immense amount of stuff in there. Uh, and uh, I'm not, I, can't, I don't have time to go through all of it. But what I wanted to do is, uh, very briefly, uh, I want to um, uh, talk about there's a new phase that came in. It's there for two minutes, and it's gone. And so doing these parametric measurements uh, you know, allows you to see things that you wouldn't see if you did the measurement ex situ. If you did started here and went to there, you wouldn't get this richness in between. And in fact, these, this is the, uh, the trihydrate, the non-trihydrate uh, structure. And in fact, to cut a long story short, uh, we discovered a second trihydrate structure. It was there for, uh, say, just two and a half minutes. And in fact, it's fascinating, because if you look, here's the, uh, uh, just looking at the, uh, the oxygens uh, uh, in the first form, form one of the trihydrate, and watch things, things hardly move, and 
uh, that comes out again. And in fact, actually, all that we're doing is we're getting a reordering of this block of uh, paracetamol. And we're exchanging, a certainly, essentially, uh, screw axes for glide planes. So it's a beautiful, uh, uh, you know, beautiful instance of, of polymorphism where you know, the energies have to be very, very similar. Uh, and yet, it actually is only there for two and a half minutes, and it recognizes the difference, as it were, and it moves over. Uh, and so we're seeing these uh, screw axes and glide planes. That's the only difference. Looking down another projection, we're seeing you know, just you know, great similarities there. So we sussed that out. Two and a half minutes, job done. Okay, so what else have we got? Uh, uh, and uh, we're expecting, uh, because we start off with a trihydrate, to go to a dihydrate. It does exist, but only at high, uh, only at high pressures. But we expect it to go from the trihydrate to the monohydrate. And sure enough, we do. But in the, in the middle, actually, what we're seeing as well is we're seeing the amount of paracetamol apparently disappear. Well, we're not seeing the paracetamol disappear. We're seeing the crystalline component. So as we warm up, then, of course, things are getting more soluble. But we're getting step functions in this. Now, we, don't, we still don't know this. So this is data that we still have to mine, still have to understand, and still have to write up. But uh, here we are, and we're looking at the, amount, the total amount of paracetamol uh, uh, in uh, the trihydrates uh, and the monohydrate. But, uh, let me just uh, show you very quickly here. This is something, uh, uh, and here's something that uh, you know, I didn't know at the time, I didn't think about, but uh, do all the time now. When you do these sequential refinements, you're doing one after another. You can do that in Topaz, GSAS, Full Prof. And you start at the very beginning, because it's a very good place to start, as Kenneth was telling us the other day. And then you just ripple up. Uh, you've got problems, of course, when you, uh, when you change phases here, but I'll mention hopefully a little bit about that at the end and uh, work that John Evans has done uh, in terms of uh, trying to uh, sort that out and put it on a, on, on a more robust footing. But then, actually, I, uh, I, just, I just actually thought, well, I'll, I'll run the experiment in reverse, as it were, in terms of the refinement. So I started not here, uh, but up here with the monohydrate and worked backwards. And blow me, the monohydrate is in there at the beginning. Now, my prejudice... Uh, was, in fact, that we were going to go trihydrate, you know, maybe dihydrate, monohydrate. And, in fact, the monohydrate is in there from the word go. And you can see the peaks in the pattern because they were very small, uh, and we just ignored them. Uh, but they are there. And so that's something that I would encourage you to do. Uh, you know, look at the data carefully. Even the little blips are worth uh, looking at. Go up and go down in your refinements as well. And lastly, uh, and this is uh, work that uh, Kenneth and uh, Norman, his brother, and, uh, and I did. And this is, this is ice. Uh, and you might say, well, there's actually nothing there at all. Nothing there at all. And of course, you can see it's not a protein that we got down there, as, as we were uh, hearing earlier on, these little peaks down there. If you look carefully, in fact, if you, if you actually just expand things up, then in fact, actually, there's a lot of stuff in there. If you take the ice out, there is one phase in there, okay? Uh, and I won't, go into, uh, I won't go and explain to you uh, how, we, how we solved it, uh, but just to say that, again, you know, expect the unexpected. Uh, indexed it uh, uh, in Topaz. There were a few impurities there. Triclinic cell, 542 angstroms cubed. And we have two trihydrates. We thought this might be, this might be a, a dihydrate. And in fact, actually, if you look at the ratio of the two trihydrates, in fact, they're very similar in terms of volumes. Two, 2148, uh, 2141 uh, angstroms cubed. But if you divide by the 542, you've got 3.96 and 3.95. This is another trihydrate. So are we going to get yet another really neat way of, maybe not glide planes, maybe it's a 2-1 axis, you know, where you actually get a different uh, relationship, uh, uh, but a very similar uh, hydrogen bonding motif. We solved it in Dash, uh, refined it in Topaz. Uh, here's the, uh, uh, here's the uh, trihydrate 1 uh, that we, it was already published. Here's trihydrate 2. You can see the similarity. There's trihydrate three, completely different. Okay, and that's the fun of polymorphism. It's, uh, I guess, what's kept Joel busy uh, for, uh, for a few years. <laughs> anyway, dehydration of uh, pharmaceutical compounds, and, uh, uh, and I'm going to very briefly go through this one as well, because, again, in terms of parameterizing it, it's, it's doing it you know, in a slightly different way uh, in terms of uh, what's normally done. Zopiclone is something that will send uh, those of you who are not already asleep, uh, asleep. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's something to tackle insomnia. Uh, and uh, basically, uh, it's a dihydrate, and I'm not going to go into the complexities of it. I'm just going to talk about the dihydrate to anhydrate uh, phase that, in fact, we put this on, went to uh, dinner in the um, restaurant, downed a bottle of wine, brought two back with us because it was our last day there. And we just thought, well, give it a shot. And we came back, put it on the screen, and we realized, in fact, that uh, you know, we got something that's, uh, that's really very interesting. And there's a lot just 
And again, if you're doing these parametric experiments, do a surface plot and just look at it. Because uh, you know, there in the top right-hand corner is nothing. And so we can already say that uh, you know, we expect uh, in the anhydrous form for it to be less crystalline. If I were to show you the line widths, you'd see that as well. The lines are broader. And uh, here's uh, an, another, uh, another view of it. Uh, and, uh, and again, uh, and Andy showed you a modified Avrami plot where you actually build in an Arrhenius type uh, behavior. Wow, uh, to what's going on. Uh, and, um, and, uh, and you can actually pull this information out. And you can see that there's actually a very close relationship between the, uh, the two structures. Uh, that's not obvious from the diffraction data, but it's certainly obvious once you solve the structures and, uh, and that we did. And uh, you've got, again, this similar backbone uh, that uh, essentially just shears a little bit as the, uh, as the waters go in and out. But let me go, uh, go very briefly, actually, and we're looking at the, uh, the these are Bragg peaks, and we have sh uh, thin Bragg peaks, we have fat Bragg peaks. And uh, again, how do we go out and about analyzing these? Because we don't know you know, the nature of the broadening in there. How do we go about uh, handling it? We know it's actually strain broadening because we can see that in terms of the two theta dependence. I've rotated things around to take out the uh, thermal expansion. And if you look here, uh, here's, the, uh, here's basically the dihydrate. Actually, this is the extrapolated line from where the uh, anhydrous comes. Uh, and you can see that we've got uh, something that looks like wispy cloud in here. We've actually got uh, a, a variable amount of, of water actually sitting in that dihydrate. Uh, and uh, we can go in there. Uh, here's how it starts off in terms of the fitting. And all I wanted to say, the key point here, is that when it comes to doing the analysis, we've got the uh, standard instrumental resolution. We've convoluted that in. And again, that's something that's trivial to do uh, in, um, uh, in Topaz. And we've got, at the end, a very good fit. And the way we did that uh, is that uh
Thank you very much, Bill, for a fascinating talk. Questions and comments? Um, Julia. I'm sorry, it's not a, a very clever question. I didn't get exactly the whole story of the peak shape and correlation b between peak shape and water content. So if you can explain that just a bit better. <laughs> No, okay, okay, no, that, that makes sense. So you say, you're basically saying some of the structures, some, I mean, one part of the powder is stained with two water molecules, and there's a bit, bit, uh, just a percentage of it that it's losing, <laughs> well, it has lost some water. Thank you. Okay. Next question. And uh, Paul, Paul Small. Hi, Paul Smart from the University of Sheffield. Um, you mentioned right at the start that you you have to avoid overparameterization of your of your data. Um, obviously, it depends on each case, but can you give you a, a feel for how you can tell if you if you're getting to the point where you're reaching the limit of of how many parameters? Right, okay. I mean, jo jo actually, John mentioned this earlier on, actually, that uh, you know, there are ways of estimating you know, how, many, how many peaks have you got in your, uh, uh, in your diffraction pattern. Uh, and, uh, I mean, John was saying some of the protein work, you know, 1,000, and we, we see, you know, you get getting on 2,000 and see 60. But that's exceptional. If I showed you the, uh, the SOPIC one there, maybe we get 150. Then I would say you could probably get 15 bits of information really reliably. I mean, that's perhaps being a bit too overcautious. But somewhere between a factor of, uh, let's say, 4 uh, and 10, uh, less than the number of visible peaks in the pattern would be my, you know, my gut feeling. Finally, Joel, I'll let you, I'll let you have a question. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to send you back to the, uh, um, no, the, the rigid body analysis. Uh, and and I, it wasn't clear. I, I, I actually grew up, having grown up in Ken Trueblood's lab, 
Yeah, that one. Could you, you said you had a, you had a, very often it's, it's possible to see what the libration axis is from just the pattern of the, of the anisotropic th ellipsoids. And it's, it wasn't clear to me exactly, I'm not sure I see it here. Could you, could you sort of, the, 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 there's a libration axis, it's gotta be one, or, or is it four of them? It sits on four bar. Yeah, uh, but that's why it's almost cubic as well. So it's actually sitting, uh, you know, almost in a cubic environment. And when you look at the vibration and the translation uh, uh, coefficients, basically there's no difference between, you know, the XY plane and the, uh, and the Z plane. Uh, so that you end up with something that's essentially, you know, isotropic in terms of translation and also isotropic in terms of the vibration. So essentially uh, you're executing your motion on the surface of a sphere. Because uh, if you look, it looks like if you take if you take the axis through C3 to C3 uh, vertically, at least the top four hydrogens look like there'd be a libration that way. But it, but it, but then the rest of it doesn't always look like that. Yeah, but actually, what I did, in fact, I took it out because uh, I did actually do separate librations for the um, uh, for the H3s top and bottom as well. Actually, they, they actually, if you if you do if you look at the ADPs, they are doing something different. So in fact, you, you, I've built in, you know, an additional component that does uh, the uh, that puts the center uh, of uh, the vibration on C3. But I don't know how it's too complicated to put it at the top. But right. You can build that in. It really is in there, actually. Okay. And, and again, to go back to Paul's point, we got uh, a huge number of rankings in there, and actually we can see that difference. But if we only had a small number, we probably wouldn't be able to pick that up. Thanks. Okay. In the interest of time, I think we should uh, draw a clo close to this morning's session. So I'd just like you to thank Bill and uh, Joel.